So yeah, thanks for for joining. Um, again, it's always fun to see where you guys are from. We've had last week there was it Portugal, Belgium, Van der Beel Park, Hermanus, Cape Town, um, all over the show. So it's always interesting. Welcome, Amy. Welcome, Charmaine, Colin, Helen. Gertie, Hetty, special welcome to Hetty. Hetty's been sending me some really nice photos of some of the dishes she's uh, been preparing and some really good feedback um, on, on as well, some helpful tips and hints. So thanks, Hetty, appreciate those. Jill, Leon has joined us. Uh, Patrick, welcome, Patrick. Um, Rosemary, hello, Yellis. Let's say Hetty. Um, yeah, let us know where you're from. Let's just give it a another minute or so before we we get going. Um, Michelle and Annie, you guys look really nicely set up there on that side. Yeah, it's a beautiful evening outside, so we decided to have a little fry. Everything is ready to go. All right. Get started. Yeah. We'll get started any moment now. Um, I just see one or two more people getting on board. Um, Hayley, if I pronounce that correctly, welcome. Welcome back. Um, Patrick from London has joined us. Oh, well. Welcome, Patrick. We've got some clear skies for a change and some blue skies so you can see um, the fires are up. The, any gap we get to light a fire, we, we take it. All right, so I think let's get started. Um, most of you know the drill by now. Um, if there's anyone joining us for the first time, I still see some people signing up. Um, there's um, there's the chat section. Um, let us know what you think about the wine. If you've got questions, put it in the Q and A section. For those on Facebook, um, I think where the majority is joining from, um, you can also ask your questions, and they'll get feed through to to me. So I'll pick up on them. Um, last week, for the first time, uh, we went. Uh, over a thousand viewers uh, for last week's program. So that was really nice. The first time, I think it was a thousand and thirty something. So really nice to reach that uh, mark, not in our wildest imagination, but um, yeah, thanks for joining. Um, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it and that we can keep on sharing information with you. As I said, at, right at the beginning, it's not only about what we smell and what we, we taste. We also try to, to put a bit of an educational or fun value to it, to tell you about the region, the wines, the property, but not only our property, but wines of South Africa and how does it compare with the, with the rest of the world as well. Um, had some really nice uh, photos from last week, some of which I will I'll share with the Vata Blomiki Brady. I should probably stop saying this because each week I start by saying last week pairing was the best ever, but <laughs> those, I know some people have tried it over the weekend and I've tried it off the last week's um, episode and it was amazing. So uh, Annie is setting the bar quite high for herself to keep on beating those every week. Um, so you, most of you know, um, I'm joined by our head chef, Annie Badenost on the right hand side and on the left is uh, Michelle joining me in the cellar for the winemaking. Um, so um, between the two of them, they'll tell us about the food, the wine. Michelle will take us through some of, of the winemaking and I'll try and fill in some of the gaps um, as we go along. More people joining. Welcome everyone. Um, so this week, uh, we're tasting Sauvignon Blanc uh, wines, but before we, we get to the, to the Sauvignon Blanc, um, Annie, again, has got a, a busy table and it looks really interesting uh, what's going on there. Um, I was sitting in the office just a, a while ago and I 
could smell the fire going up and I, I thought, okay, this is it. This is time to, to open the, the Sauvignon. Annie, um, what do you got planned for us this week? Hi everyone. So yeah, that's, I was lucky enough or we are all lucky enough to be able to draw inspiration from this lovely view behind us. I don't know if you're able to see all of that, but that, and then including our estate Sauvignon Blanc that we're using today. There was really no other choice than to do a nice seafood fry. And luckily the weather is playing along today as well. So it's a beautiful evening. The sun's just setting behind us. So yeah, with all of this, so let's keep it nice and easy and quick today. We're just going to do, like I said, a seafood fry. So we have our nice little couple of yo over here. Move our wine. But we just scored the flesh a little bit and we're just going to stuff this with a little bit of, so we got some parsley stems that I just roughly chopped up. So we're just going to push that here in the, cavity in its belly side, some sliced lemons. We got some nice sliced garlic over here as well. I'm gonna press that in there. And then of course, very, very important, we're gonna season it nice and thoroughly. So the big thing that you need to remember when you're doing fish on the fry or barbecue is to let it rest or get to room temperature about an hour before you start your fry. Because when if it's nice and cold, when you're putting it on, then it's gonna steam and it's not gonna become nice and um, yeah, it's not gonna become nice and crisp and get that nice char on your fish that you want. So let's gonna flip this over. As you can see, the cavity is nice and stuffed. So just gonna do this side as well. And brush it with our nice Benguela Cove extra virgin olive oil. I'm just gonna spread all that seasoning nicely around. Quick question, how did you prepare um, the fish beforehand? Like, do you buy it as is, or do you clean it, or? Uh, you can get it from any clean? fishmonger. They normally clean it for you, so you can ask it whole, you can ask it clean. I just cut the head off, you can do it with the head on. A lot of people don't like seeing it that way, so we took it off just for this sake. Uh, and then also, please remember, just to brush your grits as well. <laughs> Careful, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then you want about a medium heat for your fish, otherwise it's just going to burn and it's not going to cook all the way through. So this is going to take oops, lost a lemon, about 10 minutes on each side and you can see when it's cooked. So that is our first half of our seafood dryer. Then we get to the interesting part. Yes, then we also have a little quick little octopus to be prepared this morning that I'm going to show you now. That there, so it's going to take a little bit longer. So we've cooked this. Let's say we fed this this morning. So we made a quick cook video on. So that just means it's like a seafood or not seafood stock, but it's a seafood or liquid that you cook or poach your seafood in. So you got you got your you got your octopus or your sea cut, and I just cut the tentacles off, and then. Into your cook bouillon, you only have well, all your flavors that you kind of associate with seafood. So garlic, onion, celery, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of extra white wine in there as well, some salt and some peppercorns. And then we just dropped it in there, cooked it, or bring that to the boil, then you can move it well, either into your pot or you can move your liquid to a, <laughs> a steamer, like a steaming pot, and you can put it in there, it's going to go a lot quicker, but it doesn't take that long. And then it's just give it a quick steam for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And you can always feel if it's tender, just pricking it with a fork and it will give way. So as you can see, it's nice and tender, not too mushy. And we're going to pop that onto the bride a little bit later. Also, same thing. We're going to brush it with a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and then it goes onto the coals. Yeah. Could you add it or put it on the bride raw or do you have to kind of pre-cook? Yeah, no, pre-cook it, it's a lot easier. Like I said, it's, uh, octopus is quite tough and it's the texture of it. When you're going to put it on there, you need to, it's not going to, you're going to take forever to get it cooked. I think it's going to burn before it's going to get cooked or tender. But yeah, you can do it in any kind of liquid. If you want it like a tomato-based sauce, you can put it in a tomato-based sauce. But always remember, if they don't pound it beforehand at the fishmonger, you can always just take a wine bottle or something or a hammer or mullet and just give it a quick pound a little bit of salt on it, and that just also helps tenderizing it before you cook it. Is it quite um, easy to get hold of? I can't recall really seeing a lot of it in 
in the shops? Uh, um, like supermarket, you might struggle a little bit, but there's a lot of fishmongers all over the place, and you can get it from them. Most of them have it. Okay. And a, a last question. I always am in doubt when drying fish, do I do it open or do I close it and fold it like you've got it there? What is the best way? Does it depend on the type of fish going on to the braai or um, as I said, I'm always in doubt what is the best way to go about it? Um, yeah, it also depends what type of fish you have. Let's say we have a couple here, which is a nice fleshy fish. I'm just going to flip this over so you can see it's nice and popping out now, it's getting cooked. Um, yeah, it all depends on the type of fish you have and also depends on how you want to prepare it. So I want those flavors of the lemon and garlic and lemon or <laughs> lemon, garlic and parsley to kind of draw into the fish. You can always make that into a butter. And then you can, like I said, you can ask your fishmongers just to do it for you or you can do it at home as well and just flip it open and have your two fillets and then just keep brushing that and have that on low coals and just have that kind of butter with all that flavor soak in as well. So it all, it's all about preference. Okay. All right, all right. Looks fantastic, yeah. and, um, especially with the Sauvignon. I'm, uh, I'm quite curious to, to see how it all is going to come together in the end. Talking of, of Sauvignon Blanc, um, so this week is our estate range um, Sauvignon Blanc. It's our 2019 vintage. If you haven't poured yourself some already, um, please do. Uh, I'm just going to chat quickly about um, Sauvignon Blanc and how it fits into Benguela Cove and, and, and what we do. Um, I might ask Michelle, Michelle, if you're okay with it, I might ask you a little bit later on then just to chat about the, the wine making. Um, and then I'll just talk again towards the end on maybe zooming into this specific wine and, and how it was uh, made maybe with a few more slides and, and images. So let's get going. Oh, we've got a nice big crowd on tonight welcome everyone again so as i said this week it's our estate um, sauvignon 2019 vintage so um, by now you all know the 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 exercise where we at we're basically the gateway into hermanus and the hermanus um, wine route so about an hour and 30 minutes drive from cape town what you see here is the estate, uh, the property, Benguela Cove. These are all our vineyards. It's about 70 hectare in, in size. The wine we're tasting tonight is the side of the property where you see this arrow. So it's a southern slope. And because of the way the sun passes over the property in the southern hemisphere, it kind of passes over this side. So southern slopes are a little bit cooler because they see less sunlight during the day. Northern slopes, more sun exposure. So a different style of, of wine coming from this side of the property. So in the case of Benguela, it's, quite, it's two very big extremes, um, not only because of the, the slopes, but also of the side of the property facing the ocean. So you've got a cooler slope on this side, but you've got the added cooling effect um, of the side of the property facing the ocean. So what we have like clockwork every day at about 12 o'clock uh, midday, the wind picks up and it starts blowing out of the ocean and it cools down the whole um, the property. So cooler slope with the added cooling effect um, from the ocean. And what you're tasting tonight is a selection of vineyards this side of the, of the property. Okay, so on the southern slopes, um, you have this shale-like soils, and it's almost like you can sense this soil. It's very clear when you taste Sauvignons uh, from Benguela Cove, made from the five different soil types we have. Uh, it's probably the easiest one to pick is the Sauvignon coming from this shales. It's almost got like a, a chalky um, feel to it. So uh, shell wines coming from shell Sauvignon are quite easy to, to pick. Um, Sauvignon Blanc of all white wines, if not of all wines, is the one that shows best where it's growing. So it really reflects 
the slope, the soils, um, the climate, everything just shows in the glass. So if you take Sauvignon Blanc and you plant it all over the Western Cape, it is probably the easiest one to pick. Okay, this is Stellenbosch, this is Elgin, this is Walker Bay, this is Elam, this is Darling, whatever the case might be, because as I said, it really shows where it's grown. Be it a warmer climate, a cooler climate, again, different styles. Soil, as I mentioned, influences, slope influences, and then the tradition or the philosophy of, of the winemaking team also has got a final influence um, on the wine. As I mentioned before, we're not in the game of altering the flavors and manipulating the wines too much in the winery. What we would like you to see is Benguela Cove. So we produce site-specific wines, so we don't manipulate the wines too much in the winery, but you'll see later on when I show you that we've got a few tricks up our sleeve when it, when it comes to this wine. All of these collectively are called um, terroir. So that's just a single term for all of these factors influencing um, the wine. As you know, as we have discussed last week, we've got various vineyards scattered all over the, the property. Sauvignon Blanc planted different row directions, slopes, soils, different clones of Sauvignon Blanc. They're all different from each other. So my and Michelle's job is to connect all these dots and to understand how they, they all um, interact and, and work together. So as I mentioned, this is the property, various slopes, various soil types. Because this was uncharted waters, no one had any experience of what would work on this property. No one ever dared to have a vineyard uh, on this piece of land. Um, so we're still in the process of figuring out and, and learning and, as I said, kind of connecting the dots of what works best on Benguela Cove when it comes to soil, road directions, clones, and, and, and. Um, so we've got so many variables. Um, so call all of those variables different dots. And as I said, we need to still go and connect all those dots and figure out which of them worth, uh, work the best way together. So if you've got 10 variables, you've got 45 different possibilities once you start connecting the dots. So it becomes quite tricky and there's a lot of to keep record of and to keep in mind. Once you look at all the different patterns, and this is a bit like blending, that's why I've put it up. If you, once you've connected the dots, that's one thing, but now you can use all those different components and variables can use them together. So once you start mixing that up, you can have 3.5 trillion possibilities or Sauvignon Blanc. So that's why it becomes really complex. And that's why um, in my lifetime, probably we won't figure it out, but in another two or three or four generations, um, we'll get closer to, to what it is and what works. But that's also, it's, winemaking is not about figuring it out. It's an, it's an ongoing journey. You always learn more. It's a, it's a game and a, something that you you cannot master because however how much we we learn and improve not one single year would be the same so once you think okay i figured something out i've got it next year mother nature deals you another a different set of cards and what you've done last year doesn't apply to what you've done this year necessarily there's some learnings that are, are, are constant and you can take forward. But uh, in this game, we're not in control. Nature is on, in control. But just to give you an idea of, of how many options we have. So having said this, this isn't normal. This is the case on, on Vinguela Cove because we've got so many variables. And don't get me wrong, I'm not mistaken. We're unbelievably fortunate, myself and Michelle, to have all these variables to work with because many wineries don't. So we're not complaining. All of this, all these different components just gives us so much more layers and depth in, in the wine and therefore just more deliciousness, if, if you like. So having all those components, um, I guess it comes to no surprise. Uh, we've got five different Sauvignon Blancs that we produce. Again, not something that's common. But because uh, we love Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc absolutely loves Benguela Cove, the soils and the climate, Benguela, ah, Benguela um, <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc loves cooler climates uh, and therefore it's just at home on, on Benguela Cove. So just to take you quickly through it, 
we do uh, one of a kind. No one else in South Africa makes a method cup classic. As you will remember, method cup classic is the French way of making sparkling wine. We've just thought we'll be a bit different and wave the Sauvignon Blanc flag by making a MCC wine out of that. So that's the one on the left. We do a lighthouse collection, uh, the state we're tasting today and two other ones. Forgive me for this photo. This is a brand new release. It's not even on the shelf yet. Um, it's a repackaged Novolate harvest that we do every once in a while, but that's a whole seminar and a session um, on its own. So when it comes to the, the vineyards, as I said, there's still a lot to be learned. And we take, if you take all these little dots being different vineyards, we built a winery to enable us to keep all those vineyards and little dots separately. So we're focusing on each of those vines, be they from different slopes, different soil, different clones, how to perfect all of them, how to best go um, about them. So we take them in, we keep them separate in the winery and we try all sorts of different things just to, to learn and to understand what is the best way to go about a particular vineyard given um, where it's, it's grown and the microclimate it is in. So every once in a while we stumble across something amazing, something different we've tried from these um, individual pockets. And that would typically go into what is our venography range. So it's just small, tiny um, bottlings of some really special single vineyard wines, some experiments we've done, and we just like to share with everyone um, out there. So it's not commercially available in shops. It's in limited quantity, so only from the property and online shop. But this is just sharing the journey with, with all of you um, of of how we go and how much we, we learn about the property. Once we get to learn all those different vineyards a little bit better, we slowly get to connect the dots and we slowly get to understand this vineyard works well with this one, with this one, with this one. So we start to draw the lines to something that's stylistically almost the same. So this a good example of that would be the lighthouse collection where that's almost like a a collective of our vineyards that are softer on acidity, more tropical, more fruit driven vineyards would go into the lighthouse collection. And that's something we can release into market earlier because it's all about freshness, the fruit and, and the vibrancy. As we learn and we, we continue, we get to play a bit and get to be a bit creative and try different things. Um, and just have a play and be a little bit more artistic in our approach on what we do and how we do it. And a good example of that would be the wine that we're tasting um, tonight. And we'll reveal a little bit about what we've done to this wine um, in a bit. So um, Sauvignon Blanc as a, as a wine, and um, there's an image of a, of a bunch, but it's, it's known for lots of expressive fruity notes, depending on where it's planted, different fruit profile, some not, not as fruity, some more mineral and steely and almost like struck match in, in, um, in aroma, but always very expressive. Um, it's known for high acidity, usually lower alcohol levels, not a lot of creaminess and body like a Chardonnay or a Chenin. Uh, depending on, on how it was made, but in, to generalize, it's about freshness, crisp um, wines. That is what uh, people love about Sauvignon. Obviously planted all over the world. Um, I would say countries best known for, for Sauvignon Blanc would obviously be France, where it uh, originates from. Um, South Africa, definitely well known for our Sauvignon and our div diversity of, of style. And then um, Chile, definitely um, well known for quality Sauvignons. Forgive me if there's any Italians on, on this, but there's some Sauvignon being made in Australia, Italy, Argentina, not great. Um, Sauvignons, well, not great in my, in terms of the, the benchmarks in the world. And then um, New Zealand, of course, given their climate, uh, fo focus a great deal on producing um, Sauvignon Blancs. Um, as I mentioned, and as you know by now from previous webinars, 
Um, there is no such thing as one style or one constant in the Western Cape. Our soils, our altitude, our growing conditions, with every 50 kilometers you drive, you're in a completely different space. So always interesting for me um, to compare and I often do it in tastings just to show how much Sauvignon Blanc shows up where it's grown. If you take a West Coast, like a Darling Sauvignon, also close to the ocean, also this maritime influence, and you compare those to down in the South Coast to Walker Bay, Elam, how they are completely different. Even though the soils are somewhat the same, both are close to the ocean, completely different wines. So try them and then you can go to Constantia and you're in a totally different space when it comes to Sauvignon. Stellenbosch again, different style of, of Sauvignon. So um, as I touched on earlier, Sauvignon Blanc likes cooler regions, so therefore it's mainly planted alongst the, the coastline or in some um, regions in Elgin where it's not that close to the ocean or in the Cedarburg. It's not a function of proximity to the ocean, but it's more about altitude. Obviously higher up it's also cooler and some of the mountain hills of, of Stellenbosch facing the ocean's side, but stylistically all completely um, different. So what we try to do with our Sauvignon, as I said, because Sauvignon lends it to it, but in, if I have to generalize our whole, whole portfolio is we want to showcase Hermanus, Walker Bay, and more specifically, Benguela Cove, this estate in the glass. So it's capturing all the elements uh, around us, the mountains, the ocean, the Feinbos, and for when you pick up this glass of wine, it would be our dream for you to say, ah, oh, this is this is Walker Bay, I can smell it, it's cool climate, it's South Africa. And if you can tell, this is Benguela Cove, because Benguela Cove does have a distinct and a first character and a personality to it. It's job well done and we can uh, tick the the box. So it's about capturing a little bit of of this, what you see out here. Okay, so Sauvignon Blanc, as I said, lots of layers, lots of complexities, um, different fruit profiles, but I'm not, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to ask Michelle maybe to tell us a little bit more about um, this wine, about Sauvignon Blanc and um, what we should be tasting, smelling and um, yep, over to you, Michelle. Thanks. Um, so. First of all, we are tasting the Sauvignon Blanc, as you guys know. This one is from my state range. And then this is also a wooded Sauvignon Blanc, which I'm very excited about. Um, so it is a single cultivar Sauvignon Blanc, which may, means like no, no other cultivar but Sauvignon Blanc is in here, but it is a blend of different components of Sauvignon Blanc. So in this one specific wine, we have a, a tank uh, component, which means it was fermented and matured in stainless steel and that just brings a freshness um, to this wine and then we also have um, quite a big portion of barrel fermented um, Sauvignon Blanc in here which just kind of adds creaminess and mouthfeel and a bit more complexity to the wine just giving it kind of a different angle as well and then there's also a very small portion of Sauvignon Blanc that was made and matured in ceramic eggs which brings um, kind of like a mouthfeel and the palate weight without killing the characteristics of the Sauvignon Blanc from Benguela Cove, as you know, it, which is very important to us. Um, so not killing it with oak. So it just kind of gives it a bit of a different approach as well. Um, yeah, and then winemaking for this wine. So what we do is we keep all the portions separate. Everything is made separately. Everything is coming from different um, blocks of the, on the farm as well. Um, we'll keep them separate until about seven or eight months um, that they've matured. Then we'll start tasting through all the different components um, and kind of identify which ones we like, which one kind of fit the profile of the estate range. Um, and then we'll start blending. Um, once we've finished playing with the blends, we'll add it to a bigger blend and then we'll bottle in about December. So we're in no rush to kind of get this wine in the bottle and in the market. So it hardly ever happens that this wine actually gets released in um, the same year that it, it was kind of harvested as well. So never in the same vintage. 
Um, and this is pretty much because we found that because it's cool climate, um, the wines age beautifully, especially the white. So they kind of develop just as time goes on. So there's no no rush to get it in the bottle. It doesn't have a short lifetime. So we'll just give it its time, let it figure out who, where it wants to be, and then kind of uh, release the best possible product. So if we it's on, uh... have a quick... Hmm? You, you yes. touch on quite an important point there is that um, um, especially in South Africa people are always seeking the youngest freshest vintages of, of white wines um, yeah. which is, um, it's such a it's so misunderstood um, this, that people thinking that the younger fresher the better the wine is where as you mentioned with us it's kind of deliberately delaying the release until it's one or two years old and then releasing um, the white wine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's quite because strange. It, um, I don't know. Uh, misunderstood. Yeah, working in the tasting room as well and kind of getting out there and hearing what people have to say, people always question why um, we might be selling like a 2019 vintage in 2020 or a 2017 and 2019 still. So. It's not that we can't sell the wine, that's not the issue. It's just that the wine gets so much better with time that there's no need to actually sell it. And I think it's consumer perception, which we, we would like to change. But this wine, I mean, this is 2019 drinking in 2020 and it's it's not even peaking kind of, I think, yet. So that's that's a great thing about cool climate. It's just kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but we can get to tasting quickly if you guys are ready. I think everyone's been waiting. <laughs> so this wine on the nose, it's quite sweet with like tropical notes as well. Um, quite strange, I pick up like figs. And then it also has um, nice citrusy notes, that's freshness that's coming from um, the tank fermented portion. And then I think a lot of the sweetness also for me is kind of wood sweetness coming from the barrel matured portion of the wine. Um, also has like a nice, Flintiness, which is, I think, quite a big characteristic from this area or from the cool climate. So it's almost like a, um, no, it's a weird, you'll smell it. It's like almost like struck match kind of aroma in the wine. If you want to taste. Almost, um, like a, a saline feel to it, almost like the slightest saltiness that, yes. um, which is kind of signature of our white wines as yeah. well. Is that it's like a, like an oyster shell or when you have an oyster, it's that, that creaminess, that mouthfeel, but it's got that slightest salty finish to it. It's obviously, there's not salt in the wine, but it's just as a, of a being so close to the ocean, it does pick up some of those maritime um, feeling in yeah. the wine. Yeah, and I think that's what's, what's quite like beautiful about it is you can almost taste where the wine is from, if you want to put it like that. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it's very slightly, but it is there. And the palette is very nice, creamy and rich and complex, and it just keeps on changing and has a beautiful finish. There's a there's a few questions for you um, um, coming in as well, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Is uh, since you've touched now on on aging, is how long can one keep this wine? Yeah, so this wine is drinking perfectly now, but it would benefit from about three to five years, I would say. Um, again, one of those wines where you don't buy one bottle, buy a case, open one each year. Like I say, drinking deliciously now, but it would be really nice to kind of evaluate how it develops and gets more complex over time as well. It's easily three to five years. Yeah, so we actually do that, uh, try to do it as far as possible yeah. at the cellar door for those of you that visit. We always try to keep a four or a five year old Sauvignon Blanc um, available for tasting as well. So when you taste the current release, which is 2019, you also get to taste the 15 or the 14, just to prove the point from this part of the world, how well they age, but not yeah. only for the sake of aging but how they also improve with age because um, as I said it is kind of a foreign concept for a lot of people thinking and yeah there is some Sauvignons from some regions that should be enjoyed while they're young um, so it, it is quite a difficult one is which Sauvignons 
are made to last and which should you be enjoying while they young <laughs> there's a there's another question um, and i think that this was me doing it without uh, noticing it is why do people slurp wine like when you when we taste and we take in a bit of air with the with the wine i think that's what the question is about okay um, so we, <laughs> i think we've chatted about swirling wine and why we swirl wine is to let oxygen in and kind of just release those volatile aromas that you kind of want to be smelling um when it comes to slurping wine um, we do that to again take in some oxygen into kind of your mouth while you're tasting also just to kind of release those flavors so um, when you take in the air into your mouth and slurp it's kind of the same effect as what a decanter would, ha would have in um, kind of adding oxygen to the to the wine so just releases all the, the flavors in the wine yeah Okay, one more question is on serving temperature of Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. um, so normally what we do with kind of fresh, um, more fruity, like summer uh, Sauvignon Blancs, they're made to be drunk a bit colder. Um, I wouldn't say as cold as possible or close to frozen but as cold as you can kind of get it from the fridge um this wooded sauvignon blanc we serve at about between around 12 degrees that's kind of optimal and that just kind of gives space for all the the flavors from the barrels and stuff and the complexity to kind of just shine through and the creaminess as well it doesn't kill off all of those flavors i mean you can just see as this is i've mine is fairly cold once yeah. it kind of warms up in the glass, how it just shows so much more, um, and it becomes almost more viscous on the on the palate um, as well. So we just to on your point of you know swirling and taking in a bit of air on your palate. You know when with site specific wines like this, you know being here right here on the ocean's edge, you should really be using all your senses. So when you put your Put your ear to the glass you can actually hear the oceans roar and you can even hear some whales breaching out of the water as well that's obviously not any of that is not true that's just um fooling around <laughs> but if you want to if you want to give it a go you're welcome um, annie there's a question for you as well while we're busy with you guys is how about wrapping the fish in some tin foil is that a uh, something that can be done? You can, but then again, it's going to steam, and then you can just pop it into the oven. You can do it in a pan instead of doing it on the brine. So the reason for the coals is to work, is also get that bit of a smokiness into the fish that we kind of taste on the wine as well. That steeliness that Michelle talked about, and as well when you're doing it on the brine, you get that nice char. So I just took it off; it's just resting for a little bit over there. But yeah, you get that nice char on your fish, and that's kind of what you want, and not just a piece of steamed fish. <laughs> Okay, so how many more minutes do you need? Um, can we carry on with the wine side of things while you? We can carry on. Like I said, my fish is just resting. I just put these octopus on right now, and then I'm just busy with the little sides as well that we have going over here. So you guys can carry on, and then I'll get back to you in a couple of minutes. All right. So okay. So we'll get cracking then. Um, so now that we've heard from Michelle on, on the wine and what we've done, I can maybe also just zoom in a little bit more um, onto Sauvignon Blanc and what we do on Benguela Cove um, with our Sauvignon. Hope everybody's enjoying the, the wine. Um, yeah, if, if you looked at this wine last year, this time when it was still young and fresh, it, was, it would have showed quite subdued and restrained and now only now it's starting to open and starting to show its its true color so it's therefore um it's by design that we keep these wines in the bottle and in the battle for a little bit longer knowing that they're only starting to to show now so um there's an old saying and um it's it's true that sauvignon blanc is made in in the vineyard um, and what that means is that 
what we do in the vineyard is the most important when it comes to the quality and the style of the Sauvignon. When it comes to the winery, the winemaker should just kind of guide it through the winemaking process, but the, the winemaking maybe adds 10% to the final product. 90% of what you have in the glass is about what you've done in the vineyard. Comes back again to Sauvignon shows where it's grown, what the conditions were and how you farmed it. So very important more than any other grape is um, Sauvignon, what happened that year in the vineyard, where it's planted. Therefore the saying it's made in the vineyard. So also with Sauvignon Blanc, we kind of ignore acidity levels, pH levels, sugar levels. We're constantly out in the vineyard when it's Sauvignon time, tasting, 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 and we're looking for those flavors. We're looking for a specific um, flavor with us. We're looking for a little bit more of a tropical fruit flavors. Um, that's kind of stylistically where Sauvignon is at uh, these days with the style that's preferred. You'll remember maybe from 10 plus years ago, maybe more, um, people were going crazy for this cut grass, bell pepper, asparagus type of style. Those were picked much earlier, but that's a style that's outdated. Uh, luckily, um, those were, they smelled amazing, but they were like very acidic and lean and almost watery. So at the end of the day, we drink wines and the palate and what we taste is what it's about, not necessarily so much of, of what we smell. And these um, styles that we're making now, which we pick a little bit riper, are just so much nicer and so much more drinkable um, on the palate. So Sauvignon Blanc uh, is a difficult one to, to deal with in that it's very sensitive to heat, number one, but also very sensitive to oxygen. So it doesn't like heat, it doesn't like oxygen. So for, for that reason, cool climate Sauvignons always perform better because um, it's just better suited to the, the cooler conditions. Um, so we, we do both. We pick by hand. So our sparkling wines, our Chardonnays would all be picked by hand. Our Sauvignons, as far as possible, we pick with the machine harvester, the mechanical harvester. The reason being, we can start it up one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning when it's, the temperature is at its lowest and we can get it off within two or three hours. We can get it off the vine when it's nice and cool. We can get it to the winery in no time because when we pick Sauvignon by hand, we can start at five o'clock in the morning. Um, it takes five, six hours. The last grapes arrive at the winery by 12, by which time it's heated up quite a bit and there's some quality compromises. So we've done the trials over and over hand harvested versus machine harvested and every time the machine harvested ones that take it off when it's cool and gets it to the winery in no time when there's not when it's not been allowed to be exposed to too much oxygen always the the better one okay once uh, on arrival at the winery we'll do a final inspection if it's picked by machine We'll do that final inspection in the vineyard by before we put the machine through the day prior. We'll have a team going through and making sure that everything that still sits on the vines are sound grapes. The ones we don't want for whatsoever reason, they'll get um, dropped. On arrival on, at the winery, this is what we call a press. So we remove the, you can take the grape bunch. We remove the, the stems from the middle and all the juice and the berry goes into this like um, horizontal tank, which has got a bladder inside, which inflates. And as it inflates and it goes up to two bars of pressure, it squeezes the, the juice and the berries against the outer wall of, of this tank. And as it squeezes it, it uh, the juice runs out of this um, tank. So the reason why we do it in this is obviously to squash the juice out of the berries but with the, the press we use is also uh, what we call inert. So this is filled with a mixture of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. The reason being that displaces all the oxygen out of it. So there's no oxygen in contact with the Sauvignon Blanc uh, juice. So you can see by the time we, we press it out. So this juice is, is basically like cutting an apple in half and leaving it on the shelf, on the counter. And, you'll instantly see within five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, how it turns in color and it goes brown. 
and you don't want to eat that and it doesn't taste good that is called oxidation the same happens with with grape juice it oxidizes it loses its flavor and it's it, it's not uh, ideal anymore so it keep oxygen out we get it out fresh green it goes into various fermenters. As I say, we've equipped the winery with a lot of small fermenters. Each and every vineyard parcel, soil parcel gets fermented separately. So it can either go into these stainless steel tanks or we can, uh, like in the case of this wine, ferment some in barrel. We can do some in old terracotta pots. We just like playing around with different vessels and seeing the influence of the vessel. So these terracotta pots is what they've used five, six hundred years ago. So we're just keen to see what, given the equipment they had back then, what is, how does the wine shape? And then some cer ceramic pots or eggs, as Michelle um, mentioned. So we put them in various vessels. The reason being we uh, want to understand which of these vessels, be it stainless steel, wood, terracotta, ceramic, complements, Sauvignon Blanc coming from which vineyards um, best. So I'm just going to keep it short and uh, just for you to understand that stainless steel tanks, this is cooling jackets, these little dotted sections. So in a stainless steel tank, we can control the fermentation, uh, the temperature, sorry. So when you keep it nice and cool uh, versus in a barrel where we don't have this cooling, which is much warmer, we get different aromatics. So depending on the temperature, the yeast cell that's responsible for the fermentation produces different aromatics. So these stainless steel ones we keep nice and cool so we get one set of aromatics. The barrels are slightly warmer we get the, something different and in the concrete uh, pots although they keep the temperature better than barrels again and something else in terms of aromatics. But when it comes to the, the taste, the mouth feel, the texture on the wine also completely different the three of them. So at the end of fermentation, those yeast cells that are actively going about as it ferments, it dies off as it fermented out all the sugar out of the juice into alcohol. It dies off and it settles to the bottom of the barrel. So you'll see here at the bottom is all the dead uh, yeast cells. We call it lees. And this is where the magic happens when it comes to the mouthfeel and the richness of the palate. So in these dead yeast cells is a component that we call manoproteins. Don't worry too much about that. Manoprotein proteins is what gives it the richness and the creaminess on the palate. And we really need that, especially in Sauvignon Blanc that's high in acidity. We need that creaminess to counterbalance that. So we take, uh, you can take a stick, but what we've got is a golf club and you just put it in and we constantly kick up those yeast cells at the bottom so they're in suspension with the wine and every time you you mix them back up it's a process called patronage you might have seen it on some wine labels what patronage means is is mixing up those leaves so you get all those aromas and manoproteins going back into the wine so a barrel that's flat you've got your wine to lease ratio is much bigger in comparison to a stainless steel tank where you've got the lease at the bottom and all the wine at the top so you don't get the same effect and the richness from a stainless steel tank and from a barrel so therefore we use both and with the eggs what interestingly enough what happens is because of the fermentation and the turbulence that happens with the fermentation you've got this constant turn of the juice um, and the juice passing by the dead yeast cells. So it keeps on with this turbulence for a long time and it's constantly getting this richness and manner protein. So fairly neutral in aromatics, but in terms of uh, contribution to the richness of the wine, it plays a, quite a big role. So you only need a little bit of, of this. So in the final blend in this bottle, we've got 10% of, of these eggs. We've got 50% of a barrel component um, and we've got 40% of the stainless steel as Michelle mentioned just to give us that crispness, the freshness and a different uh, fruit profile uh, to the wine. So Sauvignon Blanc but a blend of three different Sauvignon um, Blanc. So it's getting the juice in but taking it into different avenues um, in the cellar. So again, like we touched on last week, we're not just doing it for the sake of 
having different components and just throwing everything back in together again. There's a lot of, of thought and tasting and playing around and blending that goes into this wine. Uh, all the components should work well and should be used in the right ratio. So we're looking for a combination of freshness and fruit. We're looking for complexity and richness and layers in the wine. And so we play with different ratios of all of the components we have um, available. And it's not the same every year. Some year we use a bigger component of stainless steel, other years more of the, the eggs. It just depends on what that specific vintage and that season gives us. So we might up the one and down the other. So it's, it's a constant uh, blending uh, process when it comes to this wine. Um, as, I've, as I've mentioned, our job, uh, these wines are made in the vineyard. Our job is just to orchestrate it and to get it in the right ratio so everything is in balance. You'll remember I said last week it's like a, a chair and for the chair to be balanced, all of those legs should be in place. The moment one is out of sync, the acidity maybe or the alcohol level, the whole chair uh, collapses. So it's all about balance at the, at the end of the day all about balance so you can sit back and enjoy a glass of of sauvignon i hope it gives you some insight of what goes into sauvignon blanc or at least at at Benguela cove and what it is we're trying to do and to to showcase and hopefully next time when you open the uh, sauvignon blanc from Benguela cove you've got a better idea of what goes into it and what is in the glass and and more important than anything else is that you can taste and sense a little bit of, of Benguela Cove um, in your glass. So Sauvignon, before Annie gets going again, um, quite a versatile wine, perfect on its own. Um, so perfect companion um, of one of our boat trips. If you haven't been here, it's, a, it's absolutely something to do. Um, there's just something about this boat and the water and tasting wines on it that's just magical. So Sauvignon Blanc, great on its own, but goes just as well with some of our locals. Um, you can see the locals are quite possessive of uh, Benguela Cove wines, so you'll have to talk to them first before you can get that bottle from them. But uh, yeah, Sauvignon Blanc, quite versatile. Usually try and stick an annual elaborate on it to lighter type of, of food and dishes when it comes to um, Sauvignon. Um, and then last but not least, talking of, of food, been getting some really fun photos and feedback and emails. I thought let's put up some of them. Um, this week, so we've got Hetty. Um, Hetty, and thanks for sharing them. Um, and all your notes and, and feedback, it is gone all out and I'm so impressed by this. So uh, this is, you'll remember, um, episode one with Jean. This is the oxtail and pea um, risotto with the Syrah. Uh, just look at all the effort that's gone into that. We've had another photo from Heloise. Just um, we've chatted on how um, Sparkling wine is better out of a white wine glass than a fluid. So she sent us this photo and she absolutely agrees. And this is the way forward when uh, drinking um, sparkling wine. And then again, um, the cheesecake with the Jour de Vif, um, which was two weeks ago. And next week I'll share some of the Vata Blomiki um, as well so thanks for these keep on keep on coming it's uh it's great to see them lynn and mark also send us an email and shared some thoughts and feedback which is great it's great to hear from from all of you thanks for for those and keep on sharing them and keep on coming um uh, uh, let the feedback and the photos coming it's uh, as i said it's it's a lot of fun seeing you guys with the with the product but talking of food uh, Annie, how are we going that side? Are you ready well, for I'm ready to go. If you guys okay. are all ready, then we can plate up very quickly. Um, so our fish is just, just right. So you can see when it's cooked, when it's the flesh all turns nice and white and it's all nice and flaky. So let's get this onto our platter. So Michelle, if you can just help me there. So I'm just going to lift this. Yeah. 
and move it over. Sorry. Get that tail. And we have our calamari. So, like I said, we just gave it a quick cook this morning and then we just had it on the grill very, very, very quickly. So it's just all nice and crispy. And we're just going to pack that on our little platter over here. And then to go with this, I just had some fennel bulbs, like little baby fennel bulbs that we just cooked up and brushed with a little bit of olive oil. And we're just going to stack these all the way around. And then we also made... Like in South Africa, we have this little thing called like a stock fruit. Like we all kind of grew up making, you picked a little stick off a tree and you put your little dough on it. So for the Sauvignon Blanc version, we just, I used the leek. So that sweetness of the leek just kind of goes into your bread and kind of tastes, yeah, absolutely amazing. So kind of try that at home. And it's literally just your normal little bread dough, literally just break a little piece off, roll it into like a little snake and you just twist that around and you just work that down all the way around your leek and you pop that onto you or leave it to rise for another five or so minutes and then just pop that onto your bra. Quick and easy and ready to go. And then I just have some extra leeks lying around to be just popped on the bra as well. And again that sweetness was yeah it doesn't have that hectic onion flavor. So it's just that sweetness of the leek just pairs beautifully with the wine. And then that acidity just kind of helps with a little bit of acidity. And that steeliness you get with all that caramelization you get having your stuff on the bra and that just pays. Yeah, I don't know. It's amazing. I don't know what the right word for that is. So we're just going to pack that on there as well. And then as Johanna and Michelle mentioned, because we're so close to the ocean and all the cool climates and all that nice breezes and the ocean water and everything that kind of lands on the vineyards and kind of accentuates all those flavors. That one just actually brings out that ocean flavor in your fish and just makes it all pop a little bit more. And then over here, I just have like this little fennel salad. So it's literally just some fennel bulbs, fresh fennel bulbs I sliced up, a little bit of fennel leaves. I'm just going to do a nice little drizzle of this over the top as well. And a little bit of fresh leaves. And yeah, that's it. Ready to go. Looks delicious. So yeah, our seafood bry with our Bengola Cove, some of your Blanc, and then of course we used our Bengola Cove extra virgin olive oil to cook everything and to brush and baste everything with as well, just for that extra little Bengola flavor. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so that <laughs> olive oil, we haven't even gone into the olive oil and had a chat about that, but um, the olive oils from Bengola Cove, same approach as, as with the wines. Um, it's only using um, the trees grown on the properties. And it's again, like with the wines, they do have a character and a flavor of their own. So it's definitely something worth trying. And they are on our online shop if you want to have a go at that. I've, as far as I can remember, we can sell oil, olive oil in these times. Um, um, I just, uh, there's some, uh, one or two more questions um, before we say goodbye. Um, and. I'm just listening to Annie and I know myself, I also mentioned this quite a bit and for, especially for our international yeah. viewers, we mentioned, mentioned cool climate quite a bit. So you have to understand when, when we mention cool climate, it is, you know, it's in a category that's known as cool grape growing conditions. It's, but it's not like rainy, miserable weather all year around. And it's not, it's not like, like that you know we we still have two of the of south africa's top 10 beaches is in hermanas and it's a big tourist destination known for its beaches and outdoor activities and stuff so we're just fortunate to be so close to the ocean and having the cooling effect of the ocean therefore it's it's cool climate but it's not constant rain and bad weather just to to, um, to get that uh, straight helen asked um, the age of the vines, how important is that? Ellen, it is important. It is um, young vines uh, produce a wine that's slightly lighter in style, but also more fruity in, in style. So young vines would be maybe four to eight years of age. 
and those don't have the structure and the depth and, and the richness like we've got with, with these wines. So young vines would typically go into a more fruit driven tropical style where older vines start to get more structure and richness because their yields start going down a little bit as they age. So the wines are more richer and those wines also lend themselves better to, to battle maturation and, and aging. So this would typically be vines eight years to 20, 25 years of age. Um, our vines are all between 14 and 18 years of age on, on Benguela Cove that we use for this. Um, and then after that, you know, it's about a, it's a touch and go. Some vines age and become 50, 60, 100 years old for the better and the quality keeps on improving. Some go downhill and the, the quality starts declining because virus gets hold of them. Their, their growth isn't great anymore. So it's a, some improve, some go down. So don't be fooled. Often people tell you how old the vines is and how, and how it therefore should be better. But just because it's, it's old doesn't um, mean it's an antique. So um, yeah, there's a bit of marketing involved in that. So, um, but your yeah, age does influence uh, not necessarily the quality, but the, the style of the, of the final product. Um, we're about done, but there's one or two um, questions. How do I know which Sauvignon Blancs are age worthy or should benefit or will benefit from age? Sorry. Very good question. Um, thanks for, for asking that. It is a difficult one. Um, as I said, our wines definitely benefit from uh, a year or two or three in the bottle. We, we hardly ever release a wine in the same year that we've picked it. So don't go out looking for Benguela Cove Sauvignon Blanc in April, May, June, July, even in, in August. Um, some of the lighthouse might go to market a little bit earlier because it's more about that freshness, crisp style. Um, but there's unfortunately in our shops or back home in South Africa, there's not someone all the time that can guide you onto which ones are better to buy uh, young or with some age on them. So the best would be, and I know this isn't easy, but is to go by, by region to start with. So if you see something from uh, on the label and it will say like ours says um, Walker Bay, if it's from the Walker Bay region or from Elam, you can keep them uh, and they will be better with a bit of, of time on them. Some of the other regions, the warmer regions, the, the, the sooner, the better, because come the time we release ours, which is December or even October, the wheels of those wines many times would have gone, come off because they are all about fermentation flavors. So they're great while they're young, eight months, 10 months down the track, they're just neutral. Ours is about the grape flavor and the land. So only then does those start to show. So um, look at the, the origin. Uh, the reputation of the producer, I would say. Um, so some wineries like ourselves because our soils, but not just ourselves, everyone in this region is known for the wines getting better with, with time. And then also, if you in doubt, you can go on the, on the back label as well. There will be in most wineries would put a, a peak drinking time. So ours says 2020 to 2023. And, and 99% of wines will have this um, on their back label. If in doubt, you're welcome to give me a shout and I'll try and, and help you. But as I said, if in doubt, stick to Walker Bay wines um, if you want to appreciate um, something with a little bit more depth and complexity. Um, another question, do you sell all these Sauvignon Blancs in a mixed case? Um, we don't but it's a very good idea. Um, we'll work on it and we'll get back to you. So maybe keep on watching our online shop. Um, yeah, really good idea. Um, as I said, we've got the five different Sauvignons. So we'll see maybe if we can come up with a, a mixed case, which is five bottles and maybe just to prove our point, bottle number six will include a, a museum or an older Sauvignon if we've got enough in our library 
Um, so yeah, well, I'll talk to the team. We can do those five Sauvignons with an older Sauvignon so you can get to see what happens with them with two or three or five years on them, how they evolve over time. Yeah, great idea. Thanks for that. Um, I'll take that up with the rest of the team, definitely. Is South Africa, is Sauvignon Blanc South Africa's number one grape? Um, I'm not sure, uh, Mark, what you meant by number one, um, but maybe in, in terms of, of production and plantings, it's, it's not. The most widely planted grape varietal in South Africa, white grape, is Chenin Blanc. Um, but when it comes to uh, enjoyment and popularity, without a doubt, the most popular um, white wine um, select. Of course, we all like Chardonnay for its richness and complexity, and some of the higher end Chenins are great. But when you're looking for something fresh, crisp, crowd pleaser, without a doubt, Sauvignon is, uh, is, the, is the number one, but it's not number one in terms of volume. We produce about 60 million liters of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we're third or the fourth biggest Sauvignon Blanc producer in the world. Export markets love our love the South African Sauvignons. Of the 60 million, I'm not I have the exact numbers, but I think about 12 million of that is consumed um, domestically in South Africa. So you guys need to, you've got a bit of work to do, but the majority of our Sauvignons, uh, the biggest export markets for South African Sauvignon is the UK, Germany, and Canada, for those that are interested. And let's say, uh, where does Sauvignon Blanc originate from? Um, it originates from France. Um, there's a bit of a fight between the, the winemakers in Bordeaux and in the Loire Valley where it's from. Both of them want to claim it for themselves. Um, but if uh, I think it is proven, I'm, again, I'm not 100% sure that uh, it's from the Bordeaux region um, in France. Um, Sauvignon yeah, means, or Sauvage uh, means wild and blanc obviously means white so it's wild blanc and if you look at a sauvignon blanc vineyard and how vigorously it grows it just grows like crazy from there obviously the name the wild white um, um, maybe just the last fun fact on on sauvignon for those that uh, might not have known is a sauvignon blanc is one of the parents of a red grape you know so sauvignon being white is the parent together with Cabernet Franc. So Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc came together. Don't ask me all the detail, but what came out of that was Cabernet Sauvignon, the king of reds. Um, so Sauvignon Blanc is actually the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, interestingly enough. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions. Let's see if there's some more of the Facebook ones I've picked up on, and on those. How do you determine the lifespan of, of Sauvignon Blanc um, without, because we're a little bit out of time, but without going into too much technical detail, it is, um, um, it is all connected to the, the pH level of the wine. And now a lot of people are gonna sign off, but I'm gonna keep it short. Everything in wine is connected to the pH level. Um, and the pH level is determined by the soils it's grown in and the, the climate and the, the weather conditions. So again, it comes back to that one word, it's called terroir. Um, with where we're at with our climate and specifically the soils we have in Venguela Cove, we've got some insanely low pH levels in our wines, being the reason why the wines from Venguela Cove, and this is something we're well known for, and feature of our wines is not only the drinkability of them, but also the longevity. They're known to age really, really, really well. I mean, I've opened some 2009 talking of Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blancs from 2009 recently, and you can't believe it's like those wines are just stuck in time. So the, the most important thing is the pH level in wines. Then there's a couple of other things like how do you look after the wines when you bottle them during the aging process? Are they in 
a cork or a screw cap. Again, that's a debate for another day. We can touch on that next week. Um, but yeah, talking of, of next week, uh, next week we're looking at what we call the heartbreak grape, probably the most difficult grape to grow out in the vineyards, the most challenging grape in the vineyard, one of the more, most sought after wines in the world, the most expensive wines in the world are made from this grape. So yes, we're talking Pinot Noir, obviously Hermanus Walker Bay is well known for Pinot Noirs. Um, so join us next week, same time, same place, and we'll take a proper deep dive into Pinot Noir. It's quite of a challenging grape and a wine to, to understand as well. So we'll, we'll do our best to explain and talk you through Pinot Noir and why it's, um, it's called the, the heartbreak um, grape. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, news just in, which we're super happy about. So we're gonna try the Sauvignon now with what Annie's prepared for us. Um, we, just before I came to sit down, you'll remember our Estate Syrah, which was the very first wine um, we did with the first webinar and its little brother, the Lighthouse Collection Syrah. So the South African Shiraz Challenge, where we get all the Shirazes produced in South Africa together and they get judged by a panel of Syrah or Shiraz experts, blind, so they don't know what they're tasting. So we've just been informed that both these, of all the Shirazes um, in the competition, were both finalists for the top um, spot. So they announced the top 10, both of these were in the top 20 so both were finalists and late this afternoon they announced that the estate one of the both being finalists the estate one was one of the top 10 Syrahs produced in south africa so extremely happy about that so i hope you guys have extra bottles of these at home if you don't there's a couple left on the online shop as well so yeah, I think after the Sauvignon, we'll also be giving a Syrah a go again um, tonight. But as I said, join us next week for the, um, for the Pinot Noir. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be the last one. Um, so looking forward to seeing you all and uh, thanks for joining us once again. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye Annie, bye Michelle. Bye. Lock <laughs> on. Thank you. <laughs>